many people have tried sriracha or love sriracha? Right. <laughs> this is the theatrical premiere of this film. It hasn't shown in any other theater yet. So, yeah, go indie. I'm excited to go tell Oz. I think you guys reacted to him the best. Spicy and flavorful in a respectful way. Yeah, I take it with me. I've smuggled it into different restaurants, friends waiting reception. I didn't expect to wind up sharing it with the whole table. <laughs> tell him that he is the best character in the film. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where did you find that uh, Oz guy? Like, you... So, most of the like man on the street interviews we did we just kind of found people randomly like a taste of chicago but there were two people oz i don't know if you saw his name in the credits like actually as a backer and an interviewee he backed the kickstarter project before i was done shooting it as did rebecca who's the woman you see at the beginning who has the t-shirt that says i love sriracha uh both of them backed the film and then said any chance you come up to Chicago? We'd love to maybe talk to you. And so when I scheduled a trip up to Chicago, I thought, well, I should talk to those two. And they turned out to be great interviews. Is uh, What was Mr. Trans thought of you doing this movie at all? I mean, what, is he concerned about his profile going up? Is he concerned about his profile at all as, you know, the creator of Sriracha? Uh, David, I can't say he personally said this at the beginning, but his assistant, Donna, who you don't see in the film, she said no to the project. Uh, when I asked, I, I thought I crafted a pretty good email to them as, explaining the project, and they were just like, no thanks, we don't need to be in your doc. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, how do I still make this? So I kind of told them, like, well, I'm going to make it anyway, but I would really love you to be in it. And I did a much better job explaining how much respect I have for David Tran and what he's accomplished. And I think the fact that I'm completely independent, I think they thought I was some big production house or something. But when I told them I was just some guy that thought their story was cool, then they decided to let me in. And since we started shooting, David has transformed a lot. He went from barely talking to the press, there were only about two or three print articles about him before the film, to he started to realize no one can do what he does. Even if I show them all the secrets of his factory, I can show them all the serial numbers on all the equipment he uses, no one's gonna make a replica of what he does and do it as well as he does. So I think he just kind of realized he has nothing to hide. and But I think they've also been a little bit scared because they don't need to advertise. So he's kind of wondering, like, do I even need my story to be out there? But he's, he's definitely evolved on that. So he's really happy with the film. <coughs> and in the back. Um, you didn't touch on the court case or anything like that. Was this film done prior to all of that? Yeah. So this film, I started shooting it in April and May of, two, of last year. And then I finished. I finished around November. It premiered online December 11th. Um, so while I was editing is when this stuff started. In fact, when you see David at the Sriracha factory, he pulled me aside and said, hey, tomorrow the city is going to file this restraining order against me. Just thought you should know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really, I thought it would blow over pretty quick. I thought it was kind of a non-story. The media likes to make a big deal about things. And I kind of knew, like, well, it's not going to impact the production because their harvest is pretty much over. Um, it wasn't until they shut them down during the month of January from shipping out product that it was like, oh, maybe this is turning into something. And tonight, what time is it right now? Um, in an hour and a half, a hearing will begin in Irwindale, California, I guess to find out how to proceed in the court case. There might be a trial in November. And if this really does progress into something, I think it's time for me to go maybe shoot a 15 minute kind of round two of this. I don't know. But yeah, I, I just couldn't get to it. There was nothing to talk about yet. And I didn't think it fit in the film at the time. Did you experience any of what they're complaining about? The no, that's a good point. Um, you see me at the beginning of the film wearing a mask inside the factory. Uh, and even with that mask, when I'm in the room where it's grinding the peppers, you see a few shots of that. It's pretty unbearable. I'm just like tearing up and I'm sneezing into my mask and I just, I can't, I can't handle it. But everyone that's around me, including David, they just walk through the grinding room like, yeah, we do this every day. And they, I think they get used to it over time. But outside the grinding room in the factory, you never smell anything. 
And I never smelled anything outside the building. So I can't say that the people of Irwindale are lying or they're wrong, but I, I don't know. I, I guess that's why there's an investigation, because there can't there isn't really a clear indication of whether this is actually happening or not. For those of you who don't know, the the city of Irwindale, where they built the new factory, wooed them to come to Irwindale and now is suing them because people in the community are complaining they can smell the hot peppers. Which is weird because they're still complaining right now, even though they're done grinding peppers for the year. Uh, so who knows what's going on. You may have figured this out or not, but they mentioned that all the peppers are grown on 1,750 acres. Being an Indiana country boy, that's not that much. Um, I know people that farm 10, 20,000 acres. What do they see as far as scaling that as it goes up? Because they said that the farmer only sells to him and he only buys from that farmer. That's going to have to change. Did they mention what their plan is there? Well, their hope is to not change that. Um, Craig, over the years, has grown with them the 20% every year. So Craig is always looking for new lands in California. And they diversify the land pretty well so that if a drought hits, I think someone was actually asking me before the movie, um, if, if a drought were to affect them, I mean, maybe all of California is in a drought, but you know, hopefully some land is doing better than others. Um, but yeah, it's funny, I'm, I'm in Bloomington, Illinois, and I should know farmland pretty well, but I had no idea what 1,750 acres meant, which is why I, I looked that up for myself to see it was New York. I know New York better. So I was just like, what does that mean? <laughs> so to me, it seems like crazy mouth, but you're right. Yeah, for some farmers. I mean, this is just one small family farmer, and the fact that he does it all himself, I think is a lot of <coughs> space for him. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions sure. real quick. Uh, first of all, what's your favorite sort of brand or kind of sriracha? Hoi Fong. Hoi Fong? Um, I have a bottle of sriracha penny, the Thai version. And well, and when I was in Thailand, I got pretty sick of it quickly. Not in a bad way, but just like the way that they eat it over there is kind of like tartar sauce to us. It's like we eat it on seafood. You don't like put tartar sauce on everything you eat. <laughs> but that's what we do here with sriracha, which is kind of crazy to them. Their sriracha sauce just is so unique that it really only fits with a couple things. You just wouldn't put it in everything. Hoi Fong food sriracha, there's just something weird about it where it works with everything. I love it on mac and cheese and pizza. And the only thing I really don't eat it on is Mexican food. I usually use Cholula or green Tabasco. Um, but yeah, that's that's probably my favorite. Although all of, they're worth trying, all the other ones. They're, they're, they're very different, very interesting. Yeah, how about a Cholula documentary next? Yeah, <laughs> that's what everyone tells me I should do next. Uh, I guess I don't want to be pigeonholed into just making <laughs> hot dogs. <talk. laughs> but I'm also, I feel like I'm completely screwed because I don't know what I can make a documentary about next that is so popular and yet so unknown. So tell me if you have any ideas and I'll make it. Yeah, way in the back. Yeah, uh, one of the things that strikes me about the product is that there's almost uh, no space on the bottle that doesn't have print. Uh, I believe there's some Vietnamese text, uh, a lot of Chinese characters. Did you get a feel for what any of that says? Well, um, the Vietnamese really just says sriracha hot chili sauce. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, it's yeah, there's also there's Spanish, there's French on there. Because uh, they do, they do sell this all around the world. Although it really is mostly sold in the United States. In fact, I have people that are fans of my work in the UK, and they like the film, but they're like, eh, no one eats it here. I think some people do. They have a different brand called Flying Goose there. Um, but yeah, even even David and Adam barely knew what languages were on their bottle. I think I asked them that, like, what's on there? They're like, I don't know. Go count. <laughs> I'm not sure they know what everything says and means exactly. Yeah. Can you tell us about your crew and the camera you used? Sure. Um, well, I, I shot with this camera right here uh, that you probably can't see. Here, I'll lift it up. Uh, this is my Panasonic GH3. It's a DSLR. And I shot with this lens, it's a 12 to 35 millimeter lens. I love it. Uh, and then I have this shotgun microphone. I mean, that's pretty much my entire gear list. I, I, I really just had a backpack and, and a few things uh, in it. My crew, the interviews you saw with David and Adam, my friend Nick, he has one of the first credits in the credits. He's additional camera. I would set up the shot for the interviews, and then he would run the, run the shot, uh, mostly because he's about the only person I, can, I feel like I can trust that 
knows, understands my, we have the same philosophy of framing and everything. Um, so he shot a bunch of the interviews. In fact, I credit him with, I always tell him, he probably has some of the most, some of the best interview shots in the film. All the ugly interviews you saw, those were me trying to film by myself. Uh, but all the B-roll in the film was, sh was shot by me. And then I had an assistant editor who helped me kind of handle some of the footage to start with, and then I, I finished the edit. Um, but yeah, it was a pretty small crew. I tried when I could to reach out and work with some other people. I think some of the best parts of this film are when I was willing to ask my friend to write some music for it, some of the score you heard. And the credits were, were created by a couple graphic designers that live uh, in a community near, near me. I feel like I'm always trying to do a little bit better working with other people. I'm kind of a control freak about this stuff. So that's why it was mostly just me. Yeah. Uh, is there a particular shot that you think is like your favorite shot or? The uh, last shot. What, the last shot? The, the it was on a, oh, yeah. uh, a forklift. Oh. Put, the, put the tripod on a forklift. And I, I love that shot so much because it feels to me like the end of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, <laughs> where you, d you discover how big the facility is. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think that's the most important shot in the film because it really finally, it's almost like I've been hiding it a little bit the whole movie. It finally lets you understand the, the scale of their operation. And I love it so much, I wanted to put it in the trailer, I wanted to put it early in the film. And as I was editing, I kept thinking like, no, this is like, the best thing, I need to save it. Like, you need to sit through the entire movie, <laughs> and then you'll get that shot. So I really enjoy that one. Uh, what was your, like, your biggest challenge shooting this film? I think a lot of it was just not knowing what I was gonna be able to, uh, to get. Like, the fact that we went to Thailand, and we really didn't even know yet when we arrived, are they even gonna let me in the factory? We knew that factory existed. So I, I think for me it was a lot of, like, I'm the producer and the director. Like, I have to be the one emailing everyone. I just didn't have a big team to help me with all the logistics. So it's like, I'm booking my flight and emailing people like, can, you e can I interview you tomorrow? I think I might be there. Let me get a rental car. And uh, I mean, next time I do a doc, I need some more people to help me out. <laughs> so anyone want to help? <laughs> That's part of the reason I'm going to film festivals. I'm kind of hoping to meet other like-minded people and, and see if there's people I want to work with in the future. Yeah. Uh, with all the people saying no and all the challenges you faced and the budget that was kind of overwhelming, what was the point where you said, kind of, I'm doing this, and you dove in fully? Can you describe that? Really before I started. And one of the reasons I went to Kickstarter, well, I guess I went to Kickstarter kind of late in the game. I started shooting in, in May, April, May, and then Kickstarter was in June to July. So I'd already shot the first interview with David Tran. We actually, so I had to go back to LA twice. The first time I went to LA, I had no idea if their new factory was operational or not, and I didn't understand harvesting peppers. I just thought, oh, it's California. It's warm all the time. They're probably harvesting peppers all the time, but they're not. They do it in the fall only. So I go there in, in June, like, hey, let's see some harvest, and there's just nothing happening in the factory. Because <laughs> their new factory wasn't ready to bottle yet, so that's why at the beginning of the film, you see all these shots of the bottling in the old factory. That's because, like, that's the only place bottling was happening. They had just done a harvest in the new factory, and then by the time I returned in September, they they had started bottling for the first time in the new factory. So that's, I was able to get all those shots. But this whole project, I knew it would be daunting and it would be it would take up a lot of my time, and I didn't know if I could do it. So I have a YouTube audience, some of them are here, the, the Indie Mogulers. I pretty much announced it in April so that I had to do it. It was like, if I just tell some people that I'm doing this thing, and then especially the Kickstarter, I put it on Kickstarter kind of because I needed some money and kind of because I just needed there to be like a contract in place. Like, you're doing it, people are giving you money, <laughs> I'm turning back. So, I mean, I, I'm, this whole project for me was just, I want to learn more about every step of the process. I feel like I, I've developed my skills over time, but I wanted to give myself a challenge where I would force myself to do the things I've never done before, like licensing content. That, uh, that news footage from 1978, it costs $1,400 to put that in the movie for 30 seconds. Um, and, I, and I really like it, so I hope you like it. <laughs> I hope you go watch it again and again. Uh, <coughs> But just, there's a lot of this I've never done before. I've never made Blu-rays before, and I just ordered those yesterday after finishing designing it and everything. Uh, I've never gone to film festivals before. I've never shown 
anything on a screen this big before. Uh, so I, I just needed to give myself that challenge and to force myself to try some new things and learn some new things. Yeah. What kind of things were you hoping to add in the film that you weren't able to? Well, what's funny is like some things, like there was a, a there were a couple chefs in New York that we really wanted to get. Randy Clemens, the the cookbook author, he was instrumental in making a lot of the stuff in the film happen. I, I called him first and said like, should I make this documentary? Like. Do you think Hoi Fang will let me? Hoi Fang will let me in. Um, you know, is there a story here? Who should I talk to? And he gave me a bunch of great contacts. And we went to New York. Amy and I, my wife here, um, she was my crew in New York. And we just had the worst luck tracking some of these people down. Like some of the people we wanted to see just weren't returning our calls. We'd like go to a restaurant and be like, let's stalk them. And they just, you know, like they're, they they didn't open until eleven. And uh, so just, things just didn't work out. But then. We went to the fancy food show, and I got press credentials for that. When I told them what I was doing, they were like, sure, yeah. Uh, and we're sitting in the press room, and the press person thought my project was kind of cool. And she was like, you know, my husband does press for Harold Dieterle. He won the first season of Top Chef. Do you want to talk to him? It's like, yeah, Harold Dieterle's way better than this other chef we were going to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> so there, I mean, I don't think I missed any topics or themes. It just it came about in a different way. There were people that just didn't work out, but in the end, I found a way to get what I needed. 